There we go. Recording has started. So hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 2022 salary survey results. This is a uh, joint little project by myself, Jonathan Dankhoff, uh, Seb Long, and Andrew Menger Ogle. Uh, you may have seen yesterday, Andrew presented some of the results around a few specific questions that were um, uh, specifically related to the impact of COVID on uh, our discipline. Uh, but really today we'll be doing the, you know, the regular little prez on salaries. So yeah. let's look you mean real to say quick. Seb. What did I say? I said, Andrew? You said me, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, it was one of you. So uh, yeah. the notes for this year. So some great news this year, 258 qualified responses. That's our best ever response rate of qualified responses. It's, it's higher number of qualified than I think we've ever gotten all in uh, of answers to all together. Uh, so a big thanks to everyone who took the time to answer and a special shout out to everybody who took the time to get that link and then send it somewhere else or push it to somebody or um, you know share it in their own workplace because uh, we looked at the response um, like where they came from and 40% uh, came from not sort of us blasting it out into ether, but somebody else picking it up and running with it and sharing it to their team. So um, for anybody who took the one second it takes to copy and then paste uh, much appreciated from our team. It really helps us out. A uh, couple of extra notes here. Uh, the responses from the salary model are qualified using a different set of criteria that Andrew can get into in a little bit later, exactly what uh, changes uh, he needs to make in order for it to work for the calculator. Uh, everywhere throughout the slide, you will see that uh, the numbers are in US dollars. It just makes it a lot easier for direct comparison and analysis. And uh, the last thing to mention is total compensation. Uh, that includes overtime, bonuses, incentive plans, and some other stuff. It's a much more nebulous number. That's why for the most part in this pres, we stick to salary just because it's a lot more direct. Um, and also you'll note that like uh, thinking about um, cost of living per location is out of scope for us. It, it gets too granular for some cases uh, for the information that we have. So um, that's something that really you're gonna have to do for yourselves if uh, that's information that you wanna be able to grab. So let's get in there. First, let's start with thinking about where people work. Um, this is really just looking at the location count, uh, relatively similar to previous years, uh, with some exceptions. Uh, out of nowhere, an explosion of researchers in New Zealand. Uh, my intuition was that they might be remote workers who'd gone back to their home country or something, but nope, they're all working on site. I don't, I don't know of a ton of uh, game studios in New Zealand, but I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, and the other one, which is something we may have to address down the line, is that the number of respondents in Southern California, namely San Francisco, I'm assuming, um, has nearly doubled. And so now that that population there is getting um, much larger than others in our sample, and we may need to find ways to address that. And I'll come back to that at the very end. Well, you mean San Francisco is NorCal. Uh, sorry, Los Angeles. Yes. Los Angeles. You got it. Yes. Yeah. I'm keeping you um, honest, Johnny. Yeah, you know, I'm not from that part. I'm up in the frozen wastelands of the north. Um, so here now we're looking at uh, location by salary. And so this is, I think, you know, uh, the proverbial money shot. So um, again, uh, interestingly here, it looked like most areas um, moving up, uh, you know, a, a normal amount, a small amount. So uh, not static there oh, year over year with the exception of Washington, which had a, had a fairly large decrease, which I was surprised about. So I looked into it and it seemed there that um, that was due to a big influx of juniors. So uh, it looks like some places in Washington really hired a lot of juniors, which artificially lowered the median uh, uh, overall. Moving on to junior salaries. So it's always a shame when we don't have enough new uh, juniors in these locations to report. Um, and again, you know, similar in most areas, a little bit higher than previous years. With one exception, uh, Quebec uh, had a big jump in, um, or, or at least a relatively big jump in uh, junior salaries. So uh, whoever's responsible there, whoever you're hiring managers out here in my hometown, uh, good for you, good work. Uh, looking at organization type, um, the one major change this year from previous years was a significantly smaller amount of people internal to a development studio moving to internal to a publisher. Uh, I thought maybe that was the result of uh, you know the acquisition fever of the last year where all these companies are getting bought up, but then 
I would have also seen that more moving to platform holder than internal. So I, I don't have a great answer for that. I'm not sure what's going on there. One thing that we do know is that it's a, this is a question that I think historically has performed sort of poorly. Uh, you know, we, we get about five-ish, maybe, you know, a little bit more answers every year of people who are struggling to answer this one. So this is one that um, at the expense of being able to compare year on year, I think next year we're going to try to find a way to reword it a little bit drastically to make sure that it's a little bit clearer. Now moving on to preparation. Uh, when we look at education, uh, it's a similar split that we've seen in previous years, but gasp. Uh, you'll see that there is not the part on the right there that shows um, how much it affects the model. And that is because Andrew has removed education from the model this year. And uh, if you're very curious to figure out how and why, uh, that'll be coming up in about five minutes. So you don't have to wait long, but a little tension always helps. Next, we're moving over to education. Um, very similar to previous years again, uh, looking there. Uh, notably, uh, continuous small growth in the proportion of people that are coming from a user experience HCI or, or user research background. Uh, so that's, I mean, people getting degrees specifically in our discipline rather than like, you know, the, the, uh, the people before who sort of came in from other disciplines. So, so that's also interesting to see. Uh, looking at experience by years, um, we changed the way that we calculated it in the past. Unfortunately, it was counting smaller than one, not including one, which was, I think, not representative of what we were trying to show. And so now we have a much better uh, visibility here on the number of people with less than one year. So since the last salary survey, and that's 20% uh, of our workforce is made up by people who are have, have less than a year's experience, which I think... Uh, I don't know, it sounds pretty healthy. It's a good amount of influx of new researchers into the discipline. Looking at role definition now, um, we can see here uh, the distribution of, of those different role types. And now, Andrew, I know we made some changes to the way these buckets work this year um, that you say really helped the model. Do you wanna quickly jump in and explain how that worked? I think it just um, added some clarity to the language around sort of like who was where, um, you know, before I think director, it wasn't, you know, be, uh, I think it was like director and executive principal is now listed there. So from my, from my perspective, you know, there's in some organizations a differentiation between like an IC track or a management track, like individual contributor. And uh, I think the terminology got more aligned for those two tracks. Um, I think there's better clarity and the, the predictor performed better. Uh, Good. Quick question, Johnny. Are you hearing background noise for me? I just had AC. I hear down. nothing. Not a peep. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, when we look at primary work function, uh, we can see here that uh, if, if you want to make more money, get into data science or analytics, but uh, that, that seems to be how it works. We also, uh, it's worth noting, we took out um, support because there was a low, too many people, um, there were not enough people rather, under five people who had that as their primary work function. So this only shows those answers that are popular enough for us to include. When we look at contractor status, um, this was actually lower than I expected, just uh, under 10%. I did go and double check and all, or almost all of the contractors rather are juniors. And so this seems to be the case of workplaces hiring in, you know, uh, juniors potentially uh, as a, on a trial basis and then graduating them. This, it's not a very popular uh, thing for people outside of junior or associate level, which you know I think is good. It's, um, it's important to pay for healthcare and stuff. Last section, I think, or second to last section, we're looking at gender and identity. Um, and so again, I'm always happy when we get to this slide because I think it's, it's, uh, it's pretty good when it comes to uh, gender identity, we, uh, we're, we're relatively well split compared to uh, other disciplines within uh, the games industry, according to other IGDA surveys that we look at. So that's nice to see. And as well, um, I don't have a good benchmark for the one underneath of, of um, uh, membership of an underrepresented group in the workplace. But, uh, you know, uh, a third of cisgendered white men and then a good spread of other things seems seems healthy to me at a glance. Um, I'd be curious to check later on um, 
stats from other organ or other research organizations on on how their splits look in other disciplines across games. And obviously, my favorite part of this slide, I almost forgot, is that uh, when Andrew checks through the model, uh, none of this impacts uh, salary in a in a in a clear way. And so uh, we're happy to say that we have no evidence to support that there is pay disparity based on membership of any of these groups, which is is the best part of this slide. Last, we get to uh, just the satisfaction. And so, you know, I think uh, people could use a little bit more money, which is fair. Uh, but overall, uh, still, you know, 90% of people are very happy with their jobs as games user researchers. We're, we're a good crew and a, and a fun place to work. And with that, I will give it over to Andrew, who is going to explain uh, how this year's calculator works and walk through some of those little changes. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, yeah, so we've got the model details. I want I want to walk you through um, sort of what those details are. But it, you know, I, you may have remembered the year before last, I um, kind of gave a little primer on regression since that's what's underlying this model. And uh, as as you saw, we've got quite a few juniors kind of coming into the field. So I thought it would be good to revisit that just to make sure that we're all on the same page about sort of like what the calculator is and where it came from and, and how it works. Um, and by the end of this, you might even have an argument to, to bring to your HR department and, and get continuing education credits or something. So, but yeah, Johnny, let's check the next slide. Um, so regression, um, what is regression? Uh, so this is a statistical process by which we predict some values by using predictor variables. And we use those predictor variables to account for variance. Um, you've probably heard of variance before. That is a property of uh, a distribution of data points the same way that like you can have the max, the min, the range, the mean, um, you can have the variance of those and, and you can just see what some of those are. So um, when we talk about it, uh, we are typically hear the word standard deviation. That's kind of like the cousin of variance. Um, but here on the left, you can see um, or where it says height, that's a group of made up data points that I had. And that's going to show or that represents 50 people's height. This is a one dimensional scatter plot which is not helpful at all because uh, you know you you can't quite see like what the density is on any of those. So Johnny, will you click the next slide? So that's that's a little bit better. You can kind of see sort of like what the density is for each of those points. Um, so let's say that this is height and each one of those, oh, go back. Each one of those dots represents like a person. Um, but like if I wanted to know what any given person height was, I wouldn't really be able to um, make a guess at that. But OK, now you can animate. If I knew the person's weight, um, then you can start to see a pattern here between the height and the weight. So let's say I only knew your weight. I could maybe make a guess at what your height would be based on this distribution. And let's go to the next slide. And it tends to be like as weight goes up, like height goes up, they're related. Now on this um, image here in the upper left, that line, that's the output of a regression model. Um, and so by, uh, let me advance my notes. Okay, so now we're able to, you know, intuitively we could see there was a pattern, but what the regression model does, it's going to give us the math to give the line of best fit. The R square in the upper right corner where it says uh, 0.93, that's the percentage of variance that we're accounting for. And so we've got 93% of the variance in height is accounted for by weight. Again, these are made up data. Um, so if I brought in a new data point and all I knew was their X value, their weight, we'd have a pretty good way of, of guessing what their height would be. Um, now here's some other models. You can advance that, Johnny. So just kind of for your intuition, these are other, other models. Those, those are lines of best fit. And the middle one, the R square is 0.54. And the bottom right, the R square is 0.24. So for those, um, the amount of variance in height explained by weight is 54% and 24%. And you can, just by looking at that, realize how like the line, while it looks very similar, maybe even identical, like doesn't do as good of a job at predicting what any given dot might be in that. Um, so you know, um, our model today that I'll be presenting for salary, I think predicted 84%, something around there. Um, now, what else? Also, yes, this is a single 
linear model. So um, we've got one predictor and one outcome. For the models that we're really going to be talking about today for salary, there's going to be many more predictors. Um, all of those kind of slides that we saw before came from this model. And those are really hard to represent graphically, but we can um, use, uh, I, I, I like this as a visualization. But So there's other ones we can't really show you, but the math works out. So next slide. Okay, so um, how do I build the models? First thing I do is I prepare the outcome variable in this case, because it's income and those incomes are reported with different currencies. I convert all of the currencies to US dollars and I use the conversion rate from December 31st, 2022. Um, incomes also aren't normally distributed. So I've done a log linear transformation to make those um, uh, more normally distributed, that helps the stats work out. And then before you get the value out, but then we have to transform it back. Um, next, I took all of the predictors and I just did a single linear regression with all of them to see sort of like individually how they performed. Then I'm putting an order from best performing to least for worst performing, uh, except for age. Age does pretty well, but theoretically it shouldn't. And it kind of overlaps with experience. So I kicked that to the end. Um, and then, um, I just added those in and at one at a time and saw how the model changed. So we can see that in the next slide. Okay, so model one, just region accounts for about 40% of the variance. If we add position to that, that would be like junior, mid-level, senior director. Then that climbs up um, a bit to about 76%. We add in years of experience, work function, the organization type that you're in, contractor status, all those things that we saw earlier in the presentation. And we can see that significant F change. That tells us like by adding this in and making a new model, did it perform statistically significantly better than the previous model? And I have model six um, kind of bolded there because uh, that was the last time we saw a statistically significant improvement by adding more variables. And that's why education, but I'll say I didn't remove it. I will say that it fell out of the model. Um, that that uh, p-value isn't isn't all that bad, and uh, next year maybe it will come back. Um, but you know this is an empirically derived model. Um, I'm trying not to to um, be driven too much by theory. Uh, but yeah, underrepresented in gender uh, don't statistically significantly add to the model, and nor does age once we are already controlling for years of experience. Uh, the next slide shows you kind of the same data except for the total compensation. Um, in previous years, this model was slightly different than the base salary. Um, this year, it's the same, like the same variables added at the same time. In the future, that could change. Uh, next slide. Oh, and the, the, the R square for the total compensation isn't as good. Uh, the model doesn't perform as well. It's around like uh, 0.75 or 0.77 something. Okay, so who are in this? Um, you, you know, we had a lot of respondents, but the ones who I could use for the model were 220. Uh, that was up from 186 last year. So um, more data to work from is, is great. So some I did have to exclude, and those would be people who, for example, didn't report their salary. Um, they took the survey uh, too late in the year after March 31st. So I, I kind of didn't want to get too far away from that, um, that time where uh, the currency conversion happened. If you um, were from a group that had less than 10 respondents, so like uh, some, like at academia, we didn't have 10 academics um, take the survey, so um, didn't include them. If your annual salary that you reported was less than $10,000, then you were excluded. Um, my presumption there was that uh, maybe there was a, a, a misreading or um, you reported a, a monthly salary or so. If the, Value for one of the predictor variables was missing. Again, we need all of the predictors um, uh, to be present for you to be included in the model. So if you didn't report gender, in this case, gender wasn't part of the model, so your data would have been included. Um, and then partially employed folks. So if you're working less than 12 months, less than 35 hours per week, then um, you weren't included because we're trying to get just like a kind of a clean annual salary. Next slide. Okay, so where did education go? Um, my hypothesis here is that if I were just to like explain it to you, or like if we were just talking, you're like, where did education go? I would say, I think that the way that education leads to higher salary is not like 
I'm a staff person, I'm mid-level and you're mid-level and you have a bachelor's degree and I have a PhD, so I just get more money. I don't think it works that way. I think that probably education allows you to advance through the ranks more quickly. And I have a couple of data points that um, um, supports that. So can you hit the advance that, Johnny? So the first one I did a chi-square goodness of fit test and uh, I, I, I advance it again, John. Okay, so what chi-square goodness of fit test does is it lets you see how well the observed frequencies of some categories matches up to what we would expect if there wasn't a relationship. So on the far left, that's sort of like what we would think if we just took you know, all of the numbers of the, the different degrees that we have and all of the numbers of the different um, job positions. And that dotted line tells you what we would expect it to be. But you can see like at the PhD level, there aren't any juniors included in this model who were at the junior level. And there were, uh, there's an over-indexing of seniors uh, of PhD level. Also, we're seeing that folks who are juniors are over-indexing on high school um, degree. They're also over-indexing on principal director uh, or, <laughs> but you know, neither here nor there, it, it's, you know, the, the high school is, is, is a smaller and than, than the others. But my point is that um, I think that within the model, if you want to understand, um, I think that variance is being explained by the seniority level, the position level, rather than the education. Another analysis that I did, I did in NOVA, it was not significant, statistically significant, but it kind of showed that at like, um, at the mid-level, like somebody who has a bachelor's degree has got more years of experience than somebody who has got a master's degree or a PhD. So again, that's kind of showing how some variables are, are standing in for education. Um, next slide. That's my NOVA results. Next slide. Okay, so I'm about to um, post the link to the calculator. Uh, we don't have it up in the, um, we don't have it up on the website yet. And in, in the past, we've kind of had it embedded and you can go in and, and click on it. So that's not up yet, but I am going to post the link into the, the Discord chat. And uh, once you get there, please download it. Um, this is a Google Doc, so it's a cloud-based instance. If you were to change something, it would change it for everybody. And if two people were trying to fill it in at the same time, uh, it wouldn't work. So actually, I've even disabled it. Um, you can make a copy to, you know, if you're a Google Suites user, you could copy it or you could just download it. Um, again, please remember, you could put in something really nonsensical. Like you could say, I'm, I am a, an executive with zero years of experience. And then the calculator would let you do that. Um, but that doesn't invalidate the calculator. You just got to kind of, you know, be honest with the calculator and, and, and you know, work with it. Um, and then finally, you have to enter in something. So that's a drop down box. If you don't enter something in, it will presume something is there. It will take a value. So please make sure that you are actively choosing those values. Next slide. And this is my last slide. Um, the... This is the, the disclaimer that I have. Uh, I've kind of worked on the language over the years, um, but this is what I have in the calculator. And it says something like, the predicted value produced by the calculator is an empirically derived best guess at what the base salary or total compensation would be for a person who has the characteristics that you entered in the calculator's Dropbox. So that's different than, this is how much I should be paid. Um, and I will also say that this model is based on self-reported data from people in the games you are community. And so think back to that regression scatter plot where we had that all those dots and then the, all those dots and then the line. Um, I think you could just imagine that each of those dots is a person. And so that line is inaccurate, right? A lot of people are getting paid more than that, than that calculation. A lot of people are being paid less than that, but it gives you a ballpark of again, what somebody with these characteristics would be making um, just kind of based on the math. Uh, so, so that's where it came from. I hope this helps you all. Um, and then I'll give it back to you, uh, to you, Johnny. Perfect. Well, that's it. Wrapping it up. Um, thank you, first of all, for again, uh, trusting us with this data. We know it's, uh, it's not something we take lightly. So Seb, Andrew, and I are going to keep 
doing this. You know, expect to see us next year. Uh, we're going to keep uh, doing this, improving it. One of the things that we're thinking of improving uh, that came up a few times in some of the feedback we got and while we were looking at some of the data is we are wondering if it's time for us to start asking directly for the name of people's employers. Uh, it would give us a, a much bigger level of granularity, but we also recognize that it would give us, um, you know, it's, a, it's much more identifiable. Uh, and so we're going to put a question into the Discord for the salad for this discussion and we want people to hop in there uh, and thumbs up or thumbs down if you think that's a good idea or not uh, just to give us a sort of sense of uh, of if that's information you would be comfortable sharing with us for the advantage of you know getting a much clearer picture of the remuneration landscape um, and you know upgrade our ability to to analyze that uh, Again, you know, we're, we're always available for questions uh, so long as they're out in the open. We, we're happy to dig back into the data, but we want to give everybody equal access. So, uh, you know, no sneaky chats on the side. If you want to ask us a question, ask it where everybody can see it. And if we can answer, we will answer it uh, there. And yeah, that's it. Thanks. Uh, you're welcome. I hope I so much. I hope that I get to see you all in person in the flesh next year. No more pixel faces. Uh, and uh, that's it. That's all we got. Thank you. Take care. See you next year.